Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization. Our new series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. Hi, and welcome to Inside Specialization, an all-new feature of the ATA podcast on specialization and diversification. My name is Veronica de Michelis, and I am chair of ATA's Professional Development Committee. It is so exciting to bring this new series to life as a special collaboration between the ATA podcast and ATA's Professional Development Program. In this episode, I am honored to have with me Andrew Gillies. He's a freelance conference interpreter from French, German, and Polish into English, and has been an interpreter trainer since 2000. He teaches regularly at ISIT, um, the Interpreting and Translation School in Paris, and Glendon Master of Conference Interpreting Program in Canada, and has been a visiting trainer at schools in Poland, Germany, and Portugal. He has also given continued professional development courses for the European Parliament, the European Court of Justice, AIC, the International Association of Conference Interpreters, and ATA. And he has written three books for students of conference interpreting and has translated Razan's classic uh, La Prise de Note into English. He's also the curator of the Interpreter Training Resources website. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Veronica. Thanks very much for having me. All right. So let's start with the basics. How is conference interpreting different from other types of interpreting? Uh, well, <laughs> you're right, that's the basics. It's, this question is actually considerably more difficult than um, than you might think, because um, if you want to say how it's different, you probably have to define it. And there isn't actually a definition of conference interpreting out there. Um, I mean, the, the very practical um, manifestation of that, for example, is that in the US, where you are, the one type of interpreting that doesn't have formal certification is conference interpreting. All the other types have certification. Um, so that there isn't necessarily a, a clear definition of what conference interpreting is. Um, I mean, let me I'll give you an example, another example. When is court interpreting conference interpreting? Um, in Europe, we have big international uh, tribunals like the International Criminal Court, the European mm. Court of Human Rights, or the European Court of Justice. And the interpreting that goes on there is obviously court interpreting, because it's in a, in a court, but it's generally considered conference interpreting. And if you actually try and you know, find a line between court interpreting and conference interpreting, it's quite difficult when you think of these particular courts. Um, so defining um, defining conference interpreting is something a few people have, have looked at over the, the last few years. Um, mm. th there's a group uh, within AIC who's been um, negotiating, trying to establish an ISO standard. And um, if I remember rightly, the current ISO standard that defines conference interpreting says something like, um, conference interpreting is multilingual communication at political, scientific, technical and formal meetings. Mm -hmm. And that that, interestingly, in times of COVID and Zoom, and that that interpreting, that the interpreters have to be in the same place. But it, that's, um, that's a very high level definition for ISO. Um, I'm not sure if you, in any practical example, could use that to to say this is conference interpreting and this is not conference interpreting. Mm. Um, I don't know if you think, for example, of an asylum interview with an interpreter, that could be a formal meeting. Would that fall under the heading of conference interpreting under the ISO standard? Um, 
because generally we wouldn't consider that to be conference interpreting. Um, other parts of IEEC have, have thought about whether a definition can be come up with. Um, uh, I was part of a group um, within IEEC's advisory board that tried to arrive at a definition, and we didn't didn't have much success in that we all disagreed with each other. Um, it was a very interesting process, but it just showed how, how difficult the process was. Um, I think my my personal view is that maybe conference interpreting is a skill rather than a setting. Um, because I actually think if you're doing proper simultaneous interpreting or you're doing long consecutive, say more than three or four minutes of consecutive, uh, that you're doing conference interpreting. But those two things can happen in lots of different settings, some of which we don't see as, uh, as conference interpreting at the moment. Yeah. Um, so how is conference interpreting different? Well, um, I mean, I would say, first of all, it's those, my opinion is it's those two skills. It's, it's real simultaneous interpreting. Um, I think a lot of people think conference interpreting is probably um, uh, at a, a level, a higher level of difficulty. The content is 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 complex. It's political. It's scientific. Um, uh, there's oratory. Um, another, I mean, another <laughs> reason that that conference interpreting is is different. Um, I'm not sure if it's justified or not. Is often that it's paid better than other types of uh, uh, other types of interpreting. Whether the, what are there any differences for the for the skills for the interpreters? Um, I'm I'm not sure that. I think the fundamental skills, like I say, relate to being able to do simultaneous, and whether you're doing simultaneous in in one environment or another doesn't really. Um, doesn't really change. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an answer to the question, but it's a much yeah. trickier question than perhaps you <laughs> thought when you asked. I don't know. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, you gave us a, a, a glimpse at the answer. Um, I've had a, a privilege of, of uh, observing conference interpreters work in, in my previous work before I became a translator. And um, it just it's amazing. It's like magic. It seems so seamless, but I know there's a lot of training and um, a lot of practice that goes into developing those skills. So um, you have mentioned uh, specific skills related to conference interpreting, but I wanted to ask you um, what other skills maybe um, conference interpreters need to have? And is it a talent that you're born with or is it something you can learn and develop? And how long does it usually take to become a qualified conference interpreter? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And the... the the are interpreters born or are they made was a an argument that, that interpreter trainers and researchers had for many years i think in the 70s and the 80s and the and the 90s um my my view on on whether it's a talent or whether you can learn it is is simply that it's both i mean it's a bit like sports mm -hmm. you can be a fantastic talent but if you don't train and practice and put in the work um you won't uh, fulfill the potential that your talent offers you. So you can be a very talented potential interpreter and never actually become an interpreter because you didn't get trained or you didn't um, put in the practice hours. Uh, or you can have a, you know, a, a mediocre amount of talent, but just enough. I mean, you need some, uh, but work very hard and, and be a very successful interpreter. I think you know the ideal is is a mix. You you have to obviously have certain talents, um, and uh, you then need to train them. And I mean, I think uh, most people agree that formal training is uh, an essential for conference interpreting. So if I'm talking about a one or a two year uh, postgraduate training course at uh, at a university, usually. Um, uh, over and above that, I think if if you if you're thinking if someone is thinking about whether or not they want to become an interpreter, there are there are other there are skills that we'll look for when selecting students because obviously before somebody 
learn simultaneous and consecutive. They're not expected to be able to do it. Um, so in terms of, say, aptitude, I think that a future interpreter would have to be, first of all, very articulate in their, a, in their native language. And in most cases, also pretty articulate in the, the other language if they're working between two languages only. Um, then I mean, you, you do need to be intelligent. I mean, conference interpreting, I think people are, people are making quite complex arguments. Um, you need to understand them, so you need to be able to analyse what someone's saying, why they're saying it, so that you can get the same ideas across in the language that you're interpreting into. Um, we, we have, there's this sort of mantra in interpreter training about, you know, interpret the ideas, not the words. Um, but it, but it is true. If y you, um, if you just translate words, then you won't have the same effect either in, in the other language. And uh, there's a, there's a theory of translation called, uh, equivalent effect. And so you know, very often, if you want to have the same effect on your listener, you're the interpreter and you want to have the same effect on your listener as the speaker is having on someone listening directly, um, then you can be using completely different words to have that same effect, to get that same meaning across. And you do have to be quite um, linguistically perceptive or in, uh, able to get through the arguments to, to do that. Um, I mean, I think most interpreting schools re require an, an MA as the entry level so a masters as an entry level um because that is if you like sort of approximately an an objective measure of uh, of of intelligence and analytical ability it's not a perfect measure obviously but um it's it's one of the few objective ones out there um then there's i mean of course you if you want to get into interpreting um you would need to be, you would need to understand, see, this is, you, def, you need to understand extremely well the two languages, that, let's say you're interpreting English to Spanish, which is a very common combination in the States, uh, or English and French, which is a very common combination in Europe. You would need to understand the two languages and speak those two languages um, very, very well. You don't actually have to be a linguist, inverted commas, or somebody who learns languages easily, because quite a lot of people will grow up bilingual. Um, I know interpreters who say, you know, they're not very good at learning languages, but they were lucky enough to grow up bilingual. And so they understand two languages and speak two languages very well. And the last point of, um, the last point of aptitude that I think an interpreter needs, and one that it's sometimes, sometimes overlooked. We, is is that a, you have to have a degree of curiosity. I think um, very often this is approached from the other angle, and people will say you need to have really good general knowledge, um, and that's true. You you, know, you do need to have general knowledge, but I think more important than that is the curiosity that was behind you having good general knowledge in the first place. If you're you're curious about stuff. If you want to find out why a gas turbine works like that and not like that, or uh, what stall means in aeronautics, um, uh, or you know, how ocean currents affect the climate, and you have the sort of mind that won't let go and say, well, I don't know, never mind. Uh, but actually, no, you, you go straight to, to Wikipedia or somewhere else on the internet and find out. That sort of curiosity is a really useful trait in um in somebody who's looking to to become an interpreter because we do build up a uh, an, an enormous base of um of general mm. knowledge through the work that we do and eventually it comes back to be useful next time we do some similar meeting or some similar topic wow that is incredible <laughs> there's a lot that goes into um becoming qualified <laughs> to work in this field um, I know it might be an impossible question to answer, but I have to ask anyway, uh, for those who are curious about the work of conference interpreters, um, what does a normal day look like for you, if there's such a thing as a normal day? 
Well, did you, did you mean pre-COVID pre, yes, or, pre -COVID. <laughs> let's, or post COVID? Let's talk um, about pre-COVID, and then maybe you can I mean, maybe you can mention how how uh, yeah, things changed. Yeah, and then I'll say yeah. something about mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, um, because it has changed. Yeah. It really has. Um, I mean, it, it's quite it's actually quite difficult to generalize uh, for all conference interpreters. I mean, there's an awful there's a there's a huge variety of types of meeting that that we work at. Um, and and they might be a bit different in different on different continents as well or in different countries. But yeah, you know, so uh, on the on the private market, um, interpreters would go to board meetings. They might accompany government government ministers on visits. They might um, do union meetings, press conferences, uh, ceremonies, award ceremonies. There's all sorts of. Um, there's all sorts of different settings where we where we work, uh, and then uh, personally, I'm I'm more institution based. I work in in a number of um, of European institutions, but I think w what does go for everybody is I mean, you before COVID we never worked at home, so the, the first thing to do on a day uh, where you were working was get to the venue. Um, now, in Europe, Europe's quite small compared to the States, and so we tend to do a lot of travel, mm -hmm. um, and it's not too difficult to do. So, if I on on a day when I'm not in the booth, I'm I I used to travel quite a lot, or I would be doing my preparation. I mean, that was a, one or two days a week would be devoted to getting somewhere, um, and reading and preparing the documents for wherever I was going, um, and then. On the actual day when, uh, when you're working, well, you've got to get to the venue. You've got to get to the venue probably at least 30 minutes, 45 minutes before the the meeting starts. Um, say hello to your colleagues, coordinate who's going to do what at what time during the day, and then then the meeting will start. The people will arrive. You'll you'll interpret. There'll be some breaks. Um, in the breaks, you'll come out of the booth and, and vent mm -hmm. with your colleagues or debrief. Um, and then after after the meeting's finished at five or six or seven o'clock, then um, when you're away from home, so you've got to find a restaurant to eat, you might go out with with your colleagues and then uh, it's off back to the hotel. And um, um, and then the next day, the same, the same again. And... He, I think in Europe we do do a lot of we spend a lot of nights in hotels and there was actually um, some research a few years back that said that I think uh, 50 was something like uh, 50 nights in a hotel a year was something like the watershed number um, interpreters who slept in hotels more than 50 nights a year all said that they wanted to spend less time in hotels and interpreters who spent less than uh, 50 nights in hotels said they you know they could they could cope with more um, I think under 30 they it was you know could happily cope with more but 50 seemed to be a limit and that um, I would confirm that that's a lot when it doesn't sound like a lot in a, day, a year of 365 days but uh, when you're doing it it's uh, it's a lot um, so that yeah that I think is is um, a, a brief uh, run through of uh, of what the day might look like. Um, I'm not sure if there are any uh, other details mm -hmm. or specifics that you wanted to ask me about. Otherwise, I could tell you what's yeah, changed. Yeah, I think it was a good glimpse in, into how, it's, how it works pre-COVID. So what about um, since? Well, I mean, now it's it, obviously the, the huge change is where before COVID we never worked at home. Uh, since COVID, we... Not all, not always, but a lot of interpreters are working a lot of time from home. Um, there are so there's two main modes of work now. One is from home, and the other are sort of hybrid meetings, which look a bit like the normal meetings. We go to the institution, we sit in the booth. Although instead of sitting two or three in the booth, we each sit alone in a booth, um, and in the meeting room there may actually be a few participants of the meeting, or there may be none, and then the rest will be tuning in from their respective homes or offices. So it'll be it'll be this hybrid of some 
face-to-face -face meeting going on and and some of the meeting is done online uh, so that if you like the hybrid meetings from an interpreter's point of view look very similar to pre-covid although the, the sound quality is um, is much less mm -hmm. good working from home is is a very different prospect um, we're on our own and we've all had to buy new equipment yeah. to, to to work with zoom and Interaxio and Kudo and Interprefy and, and all the other platforms that now exist. Um, good microphones or headsets and soundproofed offices. Uh, and then, so w my working day, well, I mean, if I'm not working in the booth, if I'm not due to have the microphone on on a given day, then I'll be preparing something. On a day when I'm actually working, well, first thing I have to do is if, if I'm working at home is make sure that the, the kids are out at school and the house is quiet and I've asked the neighbours to postpone their building work until tomorrow <laughs> so that it's quiet um, and then I, I'll just sit down in front of the in front of the computer plug um, everything in there's a, a little bit of technical rejigging you know putting computers in different places and yeah. plugging things into to different computers and then I suppose once the meeting starts it 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 feels a little bit like a, a normal meeting I do miss I think a lot of us miss not having the colleague sitting next mm -hmm. to you when you're when you're working from home it's very difficult to turn the microphone off turn your head to one side and say what was that number or yeah. what was that name and it's it's also very difficult for the colleague to spontaneously write something down to help out, you know, like a number or a name or um, a place name or what have you, and so there's there's um there's a lot of isolation in in working at home. And interpreters are, are fairly outgoing people. I think most of us like to be in a group of people, and um, now we're we're stuck at home. We we miss that. Um, I have to say, there's one one client I work for has created so we have to work on zoom which isn't ideal for simultaneous interpreting it's not you, you need two computers to run zoom it's to do simultaneous interpreting on zoom it's not it's not a great uh, setup but it does have breakout rooms and one of my customers has when they have breaks and they have regular breaks they have a breakout room for the interpreters and we get to go and chat in that's there great. and i think that's really shown how isolating working at home is because yeah. we're all absolutely delighted to be in the breakout room together yeah. chatting away as we usually would uh, outside the back of the uh, back of the booth. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's in terms of work, I think the, the really big difference post COVID is the sound quality. And in terms of the, the human side of things, it's the isolation We're we're not used to it and we're probably not good at it. Um, and I think you notice it as well when you bump into somebody after a long period of, of working at home. Uh, we're very yappy. Mm. Yap, yap, yap. Keep talking all the time, nonstop, because we've just been sort of let out of, of the house and we've met another human mm. being and, and we get very chatty. Um, so, no, I think there's, you know, there's, there's some very, um, it's, it's quite an impact on, the, on a human level yeah. uh, sitting at home working. Definitely. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, so I'm curious, are all conference interpreters independent contractors and how do they usually find clients? Um, and you mentioned uh, how much time goes into preparing for, for the assignment. How much direct interaction do you have with clients to ask them questions and, and prepare for the assignment? So there's three yes. questions there. <laughs> um, are, are we all freelance? Are we all independent um, I think a huge majority are. I mean, the only statistic that I reliably know is that the um, International Association of Conference Interpreters, so AIC, has approximately 3,000 members and only 400 of them are staff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know how representative that is of the, the, the rest of the world, but... Um, uh, another, oh no, one other reasonably reliable statistic. I know, for example, the the European Commission and the European Parliament, which are the two biggest recruiters of um, 
interpreters in Europe, they they have often said over the years that they they give about half their work to staff and half their work to freelance. So f freelancers are are a very big part of the market, and um, I th I think I know far far more freelance than than staff. It, it's a it's a big majority, but I, I wouldn't dare um, guess at an exact figure. Um, and then you asked how we find how we find work, mm -hmm. how we find our customers. Yeah. I think um, that there are, at least in my experience, and, and I'm in Europe, so and I think it's probably quite important to point out that the US and Europe are very different um, interpreting markets and, and conference interpreting markets. Europe's traditionally been a conference interpreting market since the 1950s, and it's a huge conference interpreting market. And the States has historically probably had more of all the other types of interpreting medical and court and what have you and conference interpreting is is a smaller part of um of the state's market and i i don't have any experience with the state so i, I can only speak for for mm -hmm. europe but in my experience there, there's sort of two types of interpreters um there's there's lucky or lazy interpreters like me who have no contact with clients whatsoever and and who are just recruited um, and and I can tell you the 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 ways that uh, that I'm recruited in a minute. And then and then you have interpreters who run their interpreting services a business and who recruit other interpreters. And those interpreters will have some contact with uh, customers. So uh, I mean, just to come back to, um, I I can hear surprise in your voice say when i when when i tell you i have no contact with customers so how do i how do i get my work well uh and i'm not i'm not alone by any means i mean i think again it's probably a big majority of european interpreters who don't have uh much or any contact with customers um well so first of all we're we're lucky enough to have lots of international institutions in europe so you can be accredited to an institution and the institution will then offer you work when it um, has work for you. Um, there are agencies, of course, and same sort of thing. You, you can sign up with an agency. You would give them your availability every month or every couple of months. And if they had a job for you, they would, um, they would send you a note and say, we've got a job for you. And that would you know, depend on where you, whether you're a regular with an agency or not. Some people would be closely associated with one agency would get more work from them than somebody who only dropped in every now and again. Um, in Paris, we have a thing called the Secretariats, which are a sort of a cooperative agency. Um, so instead of the agency taking part of the fee for any one day or rather charging a markup to the final customer, the, the Secretariat acts as an intermediary and has our diaries so it knows when we're available people know that they can ring up the secretariat um, but the interpreters pay a flat rate to the secretariat that covers their costs and is how they earn money the, the final customer doesn't pay any money to the secretariat um, so that's a very very french and very um, parisian solution which has been around for 50 or 60 years some some interpreters will um, group together in, I, I suppose you you could almost call them cooperatives, but they tend to be called things like groupings. So you'll have five or ten like-minded interpreters um, on a similar market who'll say, well, let's get together and we'll call ourselves London Interpreters Inc. And we will pool our clients and give each other work and look for customers together. Um, and if you're uh, part of one of those groups, you you know you, that that's a way of getting work as well. Um, word word of mouth is very important. Um, you work with people; they recommend you to other people, and those people will ring you up and say, "Would you you know would you do a, a day's work for me here or there?" And when I say other people, um, that brings me to the back to the second type of interpreter because the. The other people who might recruit you are the second type of interpreter who actually do some recruiting and who have a who have a customer, a direct customer, as we call it. Um, and so they, that interpreter is 
is a little bit like an agency in that you ring them up and they'll sell you a package, all the interpreters and the equipment on the day, um, for a single fee. And and those interpreters um, will go and find interpreters like me to work for them, and they will be the ones who have the the, the interaction with um, with the customer. I'm afraid because of my <laughs> limited experience with customers, I don't really know what that interaction looks like. I mean, I think what I can say is that with some customers, it's great interaction because, for example, um, an interpreter has been recruiting a team for the same meeting for the last 25 years. And the same interpreters have been doing the same meeting with the same customers, more or less, over a very long period of time, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And then there's a very good rapport um, and the, the recruiting interpreter who's, who's, who's acting on everyone's behalf or the interpreter's behalf you know, will, will find it quite easy to say, look, I, 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 need the, I need the slides for this presentation or could you give Mr. Jones a, a headset so that we can hear him properly and the interaction becomes very friendly. Um, and then there are other customers, I guess, where you know, it's a one-off thing and they don't really care much. Uh, they just want the interpreting done and, and the interaction is, is less um, friendly and less constructive sometimes. You know, sometimes you don't get the documents that you need in advance. Did I answer the three yes. questions? Yes, yes, you did. Just about. <laughs> Thank uh. you. <laughs> so you have worked as a conference interpreter for more than 20 years now. What do you like best? Frightening yeah. thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you like best? Um, about this profession and other some challenges in this field of work. What do I like best about conference interpreting? Mm. Um, I think, um, to me at least, it, it never gets boring. Um, I think th the fact that it's very hard, at least I find it very hard, um, means that I'm I'm not sitting back taking it easy. Uh, disaster is, is only one tricky German sentence away at any stage. So you have to concentrate, you have to be, you have to be really um, with it at all times. And that, okay, that leads to a great deal of stress and a lot of interpreters suffer from, from very high stress levels and it makes us, uh, it makes us uh, a, a little tense, a little stressed. There's a lot of imposter syndrome uh, in interpreting on the other hand that it also means that we never get bored you're never going to go in and say oh, I've done this before because no two people will ever say exactly the same thing no sentence in language is ever repeated so although uh, with experience you you get better at anticipating more or less what's going to happen and you've been in the same meeting before and you have an idea of where things are going to go. It's never actually exactly the same. Um, so I find that it it's it's fascinating because it's it's all, it's difficult. So it keeps you keeps you going. There's a lot of adrenaline involved. Um, I mean, sometimes it's very interesting because you're you're doing fascinating topics. Um, not always um, has to be said. Um, you know, I find uh, aeronautics and space very interesting. And you can, if you're doing a meeting where they're explaining how uh, uh, a lander or a rover is going to be sent through Mars's atmosphere and landed on the surface by remote control, you know, that's fascinating stuff. Mm. And there's a lot of there's a lot of that. Um, so it can it can be very interesting. And I think. The other thing I really like, uh, in, in general, are interpreters. I mean, quite a lot of interpreters don't get on with each other, but in general, I think interpreters are an interesting bunch. Um, they, they're, they're usually quite intelligent. They're outgoing, like I was saying earlier, and um, they tend to have kind of interesting stories because they've they've travelled a lot to learn their languages. Um, so that's um, uh, that's fun. Um, what, what are the challenges? Um, I mean, almost the same thing. <laughs> the fact that it's always difficult. Yeah. Um, there's always a, a pile of, of documents to prepare. 
um, the the, ch the new challenge with COVID is sound quality. I mean, it's actually hearing what's being said, and that's really, really difficult and very frustrating when you when just because the line cuts out, you can't hear what you're supposed to be interpreting. Um, but pre-COVID, I think you know, the, the challenges were just always doing a good job um, because it, it doesn't get that easy. On a more prosaic level, the challenges would be, um, you know, finding work, I guess, if you, if you needed to change or if you were just starting out. Um, finding work is is quite challenging. I mean, me, for example, with no experience of dealing with clients or finding clients, if I ever had to, uh, that would be um, that would be quite tricky. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that's the the, the the challenges and the attraction are quite linked um, right. um, in the sense of it's it's hard and that makes it fun and difficult. <laughs> that makes sense. Um... So I thought we could wrap up by addressing some questions that um, colleagues who are listening to this might have if they are even more curious and interested in this field now. Uh, what advice would you give a professional interpreter who is interested in specializing in conference interpreting or adding conference interpreting to their services? Um, I think train is the, is the first and fundamental uh, thing. And that would be train, do a postgraduate MA at a recognized conference interpreting school in the place where you want to work. And I, th and I mean the city or the country. And that, that's quite important. Not just the postgraduate element, um, but also where, because your, your teachers will be your first opening onto the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so your teachers will say, oh yeah, I... I taught him last year. He's just graduated, and um, yeah, yeah, he's you know he's good. He's 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 good enough. You can recruit him, or or her, because it's actually more often her than than he. Um, and so yeah, choose a school that um, that is in the right place, uh, and then study. Other advice, um, possibly. Uh, how how should I put this? I mean, either don't worry or stay humble, depending on which angle you're coming at it from. Most most linguists have been the best linguist they know until they get to interpreting school. And then they get to interpreting school and they're surrounded by other brilliant linguists or other people who understand languages very, very well. Um, so I would say, you know, don't be worried by that. Uh, just accept that that's that's what the interpreting world looks like when you come out of school you'll be surrounded by even better uh linguists um the for anyone who who hasn't who hasn't grown up bilingual um i would say you know you want to spend at least one or two years in a country of of each of the languages that you uh have in your combination and in an environment where only that language is spoken mm -hmm. Um, so it's no good going to London, for example, if let's say you're an Italian student, so you go to London and you live with Italian relatives and work in an Italian restaurant where people speak Italian, that's not going to help you with your English. Um, so, you know, spend one or two years in, in a country and an environment where your language is spoken. I think you, especially if you're a bi-active interpreter, so you're interpreting into and out of two languages, uh, say into English and into Spanish from the other language, um, then um, you can't really spend too much time uh, improving the language before you go to interpreting school. Because by the time you get to interpreting school, you're, you want to have your languages at, um, at the required level. I think it would be a mistake to s think you could go to interpreting school and learn the languages whilst you were there or learn any one of the languages whilst you're there. Um, th there are, um, I mean, interestingly, I don't know <laughs> if, um, I guess if I guess there might be some translators 
listening, given that uh, this is the ATA. And um, if if you wanted to get an idea of what converting to interpreting was like, I do believe that your former president, Corinne McKay, yeah. has a few interesting blog posts about uh, a translator doing an MA in conference interpreting yes. and, you know, what that um what that's like um i i don't know about that direction translator to interpreter but i do know that whenever i've done any translation it's later helped my interpreting um and trans you know translation is is a very good skill that interpreters should probably practice more often um but we're not necessarily good translators. And the same goes, some translators are not necessarily good interpreters mm -hmm. when they switch. But there's obviously a, you know, a, a big overlap between the two, between the two skills. Yeah, yeah Corinne's uh, blog posts are really interesting on the subject. Um, I've, I've been reading them and are fascinating. <laughs> so we'll link to those. Oh, there's one other, I think one other thing I would say, if, if, if anyone was thinking of studying or getting into conference interpreting, um, and it links to this, what I was saying about studying where you want to work. Um, it, interpreting is a very small world. Um, so it's worth networking at all times. You know, go to interpreting events, whatever's happening, talk to interpreters, be polite and professional. And the interpreting, the conference interpreting world is so small that although it's difficult to quantify the, the added value of the networking, it's very, very likely that in a few years you'll bump into people who you've already bumped into. And at some stage that will start getting you work directly or indirectly. You know, someone might say, have you heard of, of, uh, have you heard of Mary? And she said, oh yes, I met her at an event the other day. And that will often be good enough to get somebody some work. Just because you were out there on you know in in the interpreting world saying hello to people not necessarily even interpreting um so word of mouth is a big uh, is, is a big way of getting uh, getting work and i think if you're um if you're converting to conference interpreting or, f or if you've studied conference interpreting you've just graduated you shouldn't be afraid to um get out there and meet people because it's um it's an important part of uh, of the profession, I think. Mm. Yeah, that is great advice. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, thanks for your time and for... A pleasure. Thanks very much for having yeah, me. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for letting us learn more about this fascinating profession and all the knowledge and skills that are required to work in conference interpreting. And I'm sure that our listeners will find your advice and insights very helpful. I hope so. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our new series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. Mary David and Rashan Pacarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast, where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.